Welcome to a podcast by OpenTheWord.org, where we discuss a bit of Bible, a bit of life, and a bit of politics. Hi, my name is Dean Smith, and in this podcast, I want to talk about the fathers of atheism. I won't be discussing the key leaders of atheism, but rather I will be focusing on what may be one of the reasons they became atheists. Several years back, I wrote an article on a book written in 1999 by Catholic psychologist Paul Witts entitled, Faith of the Fatherless, the Psychology of Atheism. At the time he wrote his book, Witts was a professor at the Institute for the Psychological Sciences based in Arlington, Virginia. It's a Catholic graduate school. In his book, Witts argued that as much as atheists like to claim their refusal to believe in God is due to, due to the lack of scientific evidence God exists, Witt states it may actually be due to a broken relationship with their father or father figures in their life. His book, <laughs> it caused quite a stir among atheists when it was published, and so did my article on OpenTheWord.org. Shortly after the article was posted, I received an email from a self-professing atheist stating that he had a great relationship with his father and this had nothing to do with his atheistic beliefs. I, I responded. Uh, I thanked him for his email and added that I was just reporting on the conclusions of its book, which, based, which was based on his personal experiences and, of course, his research. Then, over the next couple of hours, I received another five or six emails from this fellow, none of which I responded to, telling me in no uncertain terms that I was wrong. By the sixth email, I was thinking of that line from Shakespeare's Hamlet, which reads, The lady doth protest too much, methinks which speaks of an overreaction that causes a person to doubt the sincerity of the truth behind a person's strong denial. I think my article, and particularly Witz's book, had struck a nerve in this man's life. Now, Witz came to this conclusion about atheism after studying the biographies of several radical atheists, such as Madeleine Murray O'Hare, Voltaire, and Nietzsche, and he noticed that many of them had one common denominator. They had a broken relationship with their father. It wasn't just abusive. There were also instances that they had lost their father at an early age, either through death or simply abandonment. Witz added that all the atheists came from these type of homes, but so many did that Witz believed that this was no longer just a coincidence. He concluded that many atheists had been spiritually impacted by what happened to them in childhood. In an updated version of his book, Witz cited the example of one of the world's most infamous atheists, German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche, who died in 1900. Nietzsche's father was a Lutheran pastor. In fact, the family, was, the family tree was full of pastors. He didn't come from an abusive home, but his father died of a brain disease when Friedrich was just five years old. His father had been sickly for the year prior and experienced what many believed were epileptic seizures. His death had a profound, I mean, a profound impact on Nietzsche. One biographer wrote that Nietzsche was, quote, passionately attached to his father and the shock of losing him was profound, unquote. At this age, Witz adds that children believe death is a choice, and when a parent dies, they are blamed for the hurt it causes. It's the parent's fault. Perhaps not coincidentally, Nietzsche would begin to aggressively oppose Christianity later in life and develop what, what became known as the God is Dead movement, eerily paralleling his own experience as a child. And then there was Madeleine O'Hare, a modern atheist who died in 1995. It was her lawsuit in the 1960s that resulted in prayer being banned from American schools. 
though we don't have a lot of information on her upbringing, this points to the memoir written by her son that describes the relationship between O'Hare and her father, which of course would be the son's grandfather. He wrote, quote, we rarely did anything together as a family. The hatred between my grandfather and mother barred such wholesome scenes, unquote. Vitz goes on to describe one, one incident recorded by O'Hare's son when he saw his mother try to kill her father with a 10-inch knife. Though she failed in her assault, she screamed, I'll see you dead. I'll get you yet. I'll walk on your grave. O'Hare had a horrific, hate-filled relationship with her father, which Bits believes explains her vitriolic hatred of God and Christianity. Now, to be fair, as Vitz points out, there are atheists who seem to have a good relationship with their father, but even in those instances, we sometimes don't have the full picture. In a podcast interview with Patrick Coffin, Vitz told the story of an encounter with a well-known atheist psychologist, El Albert Alice, who died in 2007. Both he and Vitz were speaking at the same conference on the topic of psychology. Vitz presented a theistic approach and touched on how a person's relationship with their father can impact their spiritual life. Ellis, whose presentation immediately followed, spoke on the same subject and presented an atheistic perspective. As Vitz was leaving the session, he ended up walking out with Ellis, who said in response to Vitz's presentation that he had gotten along fine with his father. Vitz responded, quote, well, it's a psychological hypothesis, and it appears to be valid in upwards to 50 to 60 percent of the cases. After returning to New York, Vitz sent a copy of the presentation he had made to a friend who worked as an editor for a book publisher. Out of the blue, the man shocked Vitz by telling him his thesis fit perfectly with what happened to Albert Ellis, whose biography the editor just happened to be proofing. The biography revealed the parental neglect that Ellis experienced while growing up. At five years of age, he was hospitalized for nearly a year and was rarely visited by anyone in the family during his stay in hospital. Then his father abandoned the family, and Ellis, along with his younger brother, had to take on the responsibility of looking after the family both financially and maternally because their mother was mentally and physically unfit. Though the father popped into the neighborhood from time to time, he avoided the family home and ignored his family responsibilities, forcing Ellis to carry the load. He had been abandoned by his earthly father and, perhaps not surprisingly, concluded that there was no God either. If this is right, this would suggest that being an atheist is, is as much an emotional decision as it is a mental one. And this emotional connection oddly shows up in an interesting study conducted by researchers from Harvard University and the University of Wyoming. We often hear people expressing a common sentiment that our thoughts and prayers are with, with those who are going through extremely difficult times. But how much do people receiving these thoughts and prayers actually value them? In the follow-up to Hurricane Lawrence, which slammed into, into the state of North Carolina in 2018, causing massive flooding and damage, the researchers asked 482 people from that state how much they would pay for people to pray or think of them during a time of crisis. The 482 people ranged from atheists on one hand to Christians and, of course, everything in between. As part of this study, each participant was given $5 and told to use it to get people to either pray for them or think of them during this time of crisis. They found that those on the Christian side of the spectrum 
were willing to pay up to $7.17 for a priest to pray for them. This meant, in some instances, they were actually chipping in money from their own pocket. They were also willing to pay, on average, $4.36 for a stranger to pray for them. But what shocked the researchers was a strange thing that happened on the other side of the religious spectrum, those who were closer to atheism. They were willing to pay Christians $3.54 not, I repeat, not to pray for them, and $1.66 for a priest not to pray for them. This is puzzling, because if atheism is solely an intellectual decision, why would you pay someone not to pray for you? At best, an atheist should be indifferent. If God doesn't exist, why would you care if a person prays for you or doesn't pray for you, much less go to the extreme extent of paying them not to pray? University of Wyoming economics professor Linda Thunstrom summed up their study this way, stating, quote, The last result is surprising because one might expect that atheist agnostics should be indifferent to people praying for them. Why care if you don't believe in the gesture?" Unquote. Instead of being an intellectual issue, is it possible that atheism is an issue of the heart? This leads us to an interesting verse in the book of Genesis that may explain the curious connection between the relationship we have with our parents and our perceptions about God. In Genesis 1, verse 26, we read that God said, quote, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. The Hebrew word translated likeness, demuth, demuth, means to model or shape. Though man was fashioned in flesh, God created us with a mind and emotions, giving us the ability to have a relationship with our Heavenly Father. The second word, image, tesalem, means to be a representation or representative figure. The writers and prophets of the Old Testament use the same Hebrew word to describe idols as we see in 2 Kings chapter 11, verse 18, where the word was used to describe a Baal idol. It would seem that God intended men and women to be the idols representing him not chunks of rock or carved wooden figures. But it, but it begs the question, who were we supposed to represent God to? If we're all created in the image of God, it would be fruitless walking around telling every, everybody we meet, oh my, you look divine today, because we all look divine. I believe God intended husbands and wives to be a representative or an idol of sorts of what God was like to their children. As children interacted with their parents, they gained an intimate understanding of who God was. This perception would be a natural bridge leading children into a personal relationship with their true spiritual father as they mature. But then came man's catastrophic fall into sin. In an instant, these perfect idols were scarred and disfigured, leaving all children with a flawed impression of God. what God was really like. In extreme cases, it would be easy to see how a person's perception of God would be so flawed, he or she would simply reject God's existence altogether. But does this distortion only impact atheists? Smack in the middle of the Ten Commandments, we are told to honor our mothers and fathers. Exodus 20, verse 12. This commandment is strangely directed that those who believe in God as believers, we are commanded to honor our parents. Because of man's fall into sin, parents are not perfect, even Christian ones, and believers are equally impacted by parental failures. But even so, we are commanded to honor them. Depending on how bad the abuse was, this may, may be a bridge too far, even as Christians. How can we honor a father who was a drunk, belligerent, demanding, and even violent? However, I wonder if unresolved issues between our parents can potentially hinder our relationship with God. Can these 
family struggles potentially become spiritual ba barriers. I wonder if our flawed perceptions of God, such as he loves others more than he loves you, may be based on your perception that your parents loved your brother and sister more than you. Maybe you don't feel you could ever meet God's expectations. Could this be based on the feeling that you could never please your parents? No matter what you did, it wasn't good enough. We all have flawed parents who are unfortunately the byproduct of their parents. God deeply desires to have a personal and trusting relationship with each one of us. And one of the blockages that could be hindering this from happening are resentments that we are still holding against our parents. We need to resolve these heart issues by forgiving our parents. They may even be dead. And if so, then you need to finally bury them by forgiving them. Thanks for joining me on this podcast, and we will catch you again. Thanks again for joining us on our podcast. Please check out our website at OpenTheWord.org. If you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe to receive notifications of future broadcasts. As well, please take a moment to provide a rating and even a review. Thanks again for listening.